Morning. So good to see everyone this morning. I echo what Brother David said earlier. If you are visiting with us, we are encouraged to have you with us today and want to invite you to come back and be with us any time that you may have the opportunity to do so as well. It's good to see so many of our members with us today. We do have some that, of course, are sick and uh, dealing with various infirmities, and we need to continue to remember each one of them in our prayers as well. I'm sure this week there will probably be some of us that will be traveling for the holidays, and we need to keep each other in our prayers over the uh, next week that is ahead. We noticed in our scripture reading this morning from Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17, that it was a Sabbath day, and as the practice of the Jews, they came into the synagogue on the Sabbath day to worship God. Jesus, being a Jew himself, went into the synagogue. And when he went into the synagogue, he stood up and he began to teach. But as he was teaching, something else caught his eye. A lady came into the synagogue that was struggling tremendously. A woman came in who had been infirm for 18 years. This lady struggled with a back infirmity that was so bad that she walked stooped over and putting it into modern language it says that she was facing the ground as she walked. For 18 years she had been unable to straighten herself up. For 18 years she had dealt with this tremendous disability that she had. When Jesus looked up and he saw her, he had pity on this woman, but not only did he have pity, he had mercy for her. And he called out to her and he said, Woman, come to me. And she came to him and he said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. He laid his hands upon her and immediately her back became straight. She was restored back to a perfect posture something she had been unable to enjoy for 18 long years. Now you would think something like this would be a, an occasion for rejoicing. You would think that everyone that was there that, would, that witnessed this would recognize that something spectacular had happened. And they would want to hear more about what Jesus had to say. But we find that there was one man who was the ruler of this synagogue who didn't like what had happened. And he began to criticize Jesus for performing a miracle upon the Sabbath day. Well, Jesus then uses some very wise logic. And by the time that he is finished, he has brought all of his opposition to shame. But everyone else was delighted in the things that he was doing. Now I want to bring this story into a more modern perspective. I want you to picture in your mind with me that we've gathered together here at Pyburn Street to worship God. A lady comes in that we are all very well acquainted with. A lady that we know has struggled with a tremendous disability for 18 years. She has such advanced back problems that she can't stand up straight that when she does stand up she's so stooped over that she faces the ground. For 18 years she's been on the church's prayer list. For 18 years she has held out hope that there would be a cure for the infirmity that she has. She knows that all eyes are upon her. She knows that the children are looking at her and asking their parents, why is she the way she is? Why does she look like that? She knows that the adults are looking at her with eyes of pity. But she knows that they can do nothing to help. The doctors have told her that her prognosis is very grim. 
that eventually she would become bedridden because there is no cure for the problem that she has. Folks, here is a woman who was bent. But we see some wonderful things in this woman that show us that while she was bent, she was not broken. Little did she know that when she entered the synagogue on that day, that she was going to depart a changed woman. She was going to depart with her life straightened out. She was going to leave completely healed. But what was so different? This was a practice that more than likely was very familiar to this woman. This was something that she would have done every Sabbath, if not more so through the week. Entered into the synagogue. But what was different about this day? This day she came into contact with Jesus Christ. While Jesus is there teaching, this lady comes struggling in. He calls out to her. And he sets her free from this infirmity. But this morning... I would like to put ourselves into this story. And I'd like to see some of the wonderful lessons that we're able to learn from this dear woman, from this very powerful and challenging account that Jesus presents to us here in the Gospels. First, from this lesson, we're able to see that Satan is alive and well and at work. For this passage very plainly tells us that the infirmity that this woman was struggling with was something that Satan had brought upon her. But yet, we see so many in the world today, and even many in the church today, that when some type of bad thing befalls us, or we fall into some type of, of poor health, or a disability, or something of that nature, who's the one that usually gets the blame? People like to blame God. They want to cry out to God, God, why have you allowed this to happen to me? And we fail to realize that as James tells us in James 1 and verse 17, that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God blesses us with only good things. The things that God pours out upon us are only those things that are positive. Those things that will build us up and strengthen us. But Satan is working on each and every one of us. And he is trying to attack us from three different ways. He's trying to attack us spiritually. He's trying to attack us emotionally. And he's trying to attack us physically. And when we look at the things that are going on in our own lives as well as the things that are going on in the world around us today, we must keep in mind that every ugly, hurtful, harmful thought and behavior comes only from Satan. None of those things are coming from God. God does not tempt us. God allows us to be tempted, but He gives us a way of escape. And all of these things stem from that first mistake. That first sin there in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve ate of that forbidden fruit. Satan was at the heart of it. And he's been at the heart of everything bad, everything wicked and sinful from that point through today. He is the cause of everything bad. Every hurt, every pain, every war, every disease, every thought that, is, that is, is negative and divisive, every mean-spirited behavior, every word of gossip, all of these things Satan is at the heart of. He is the catalyst that promotes those things. They're not coming from God. They're all a result of Satan's work in this world. But we as children of God, we must realize that while we are living in a sinful world 
And while the prince of this world, Satan, is going around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, that we must live in this world, but we cannot be of this world. We're a part of that kingdom that Brother Don spoke about before we partook of the Lord's Supper. And as a part of that kingdom, Jesus says, we're a part of a kingdom that's not of this world. Therefore, the thing that we must be devoted upon or devoted to is serving God and being a part of this kingdom. Being separated from the things of this world. That's the only way that we can be pleasing to God. To remove those things from this life that position us along the lines of Satan rather than along the sides of God. God has the power to deliver us from the control of Satan. Before we became children of God, we were under the control of Satan. We were the servants of Satan. But by coming into contact with Jesus Christ, coming into contact with his blood in the waters of baptism, we've been set free from the snares that Satan had upon us. We're no longer the servants of this world and the prince of this world. We now are the servants of God. We are his adopted children. We're a part of his family. And he says that all who are willing to come to him through faith, repentance, and baptism, that we may be set free from the control of Satan. And although we may look at ourselves and we may say that our life is pretty messed up. We may look at ourselves and we may think that we are unworthy to be saved. We may think that we are so bent out of shape that there's no way that we can straighten up again. God says, no, that's not the case. God says, as long as there is still breath in your lungs, that you have the ability to turn your life around. And by coming into contact with Christ, it does not matter how many curves, how many bends that there are, those things can be made straight. Our lives can be straightened out. But secondly, and this is a very important lesson, especially for me, this is something I struggle with considerably. Secondly, this lesson teaches us about patience. Folks, here we had a woman who suffered for 18 years. That's a long time. She suffered for 18 years. But notice she kept the faith. She kept her faith and as a result of that, she received a reward for that. Eventually she was healed of that infirmity that she had. Now, do you think it was hard for her to get around? Do you think it was hard for her to function? Do you think it was hard for her to get up and get herself ready and get to the synagogue? Do you think it was hard for her to walk through the streets to get to that place? Do you think it was hard for her to sit there and listen to someone get up and read from the law of Moses? Folks, I'm sure it was. But for 18 years, as this infirmity continued to worsen, she kept the faith. She stayed strong and steadfast in her devotion to God. I wonder how many times she prayed for healing. I wonder how many times she begged and pleaded with God to set her free from this infirmity. Only for each day to pass by and her condition to get worse and worse. Folks, she gives us a powerful example of faith. Of someone that, despite living a very hard life, a life of tremendous struggle, she stayed strong. She remained patient. And eventually she received a reward. Another very important lesson that we learn from this lady is that good things come 
to those who worship God. Although this lady's prayers seemingly were going unanswered, for 18 years, she was wanting to be healed. She was wanting to find some kind of cure, something that would provide some relief from this problem that she was having. But yet it seemed those prayers were not being heard. But despite this, she continued to worship God. Now if we went by our worship schedule here at Pyburn Street, in 18 years she would have worshipped God 935 times. 935 times. She would have entered into that into that synagogue 935 times, stooped over, infirm, and got up and left in the same way that she arrived. But ask yourself, what if she had finally said enough is enough? What if after 935 times she said, you know what, it's getting too hard, my life is just not going the way that it needs to be, it, my faith is not blessing me in the way I think it should be, so I'm just going to quit. She never would have come to Christ. She never would have found that healing that she so desired. Folks, if she had quit worshiping God, she would have missed a blessing. Each time that we come together in this place, be it for Bible study, be it for worship service, whatever the case may be, we receive a blessing. The writer of Hebrews addresses this very powerfully in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 22. He writes, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He's talking about the assurance that we have of salvation. After we become a child of God, knowing that we're going to go to heaven, that assurance is what leads us to wanting to come together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Then he goes on, he says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, saying let us stay strong in our devotion to God. Regardless of what may come along, regardless of how hard life may be, we need to stay strong and steadfast in that devotion. For he is faithful that promised, and let us consider one another. Now folks, this is something I think we fail to consider very often. Whenever we come together to worship God, our presence or our absence has an effect upon the whole. It can either uplift and encourage or it can discourage. Therefore, what the Hebrew writer is saying, he says that whenever we consider coming to worship God, we don't need to be thinking just about ourselves and what we can get out of it, but what we can give to God and what we can do to encourage our brothers and sisters. He says, and then we need to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And we do this through coming together by being in the presence of our brothers and sisters. Like David mentioned in our announcements earlier, we look forward to being with our brethren. We look forward to being able to come here. Why? Because we love each other and we build each other up. We help each other along the way. But so many times you see those that develop this mentality that just having faith is enough, but we don't really need the church. We want Jesus, but we don't want the church. I don't see how anybody could make it even a day without having their brothers and sisters in Christ. Knowing that wonderful support system that we have and it's not just our brothers and sisters here at Pyburn Street. It's our brothers and sisters worldwide. Folks, God knew what he was doing when he instituted the church the way he did. Just like back in the Garden of Eden, when he looked at Adam and he said, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good 
for man's spiritual health to be alone. We need one another. We need that encouragement. We need to consider one another. And he says, we do this so much the more as we see the day approaching. And he says, as our understanding of impending judgment deepens, we realize the importance of worship and study that much more. We realize why we need this. And it becomes something that we look so forward to. But then he goes on and he says, for if we sin willfully... Now hold on just a minute. In this whole context, folks, he's talking about coming together to worship. He says, for if we sin willfully, in this context he's saying, if we willfully neglect our service to God, if we willfully forsake the assembly. Now let me take a step back for just a moment. This is not talking about situations that are unavoidable. This is not talking about situations to where we have health issues or things that, that prevent us from being here. It's not talking about situations where maybe we have a certain career that from time to time prevent us from being at services. This is talking about situations where we have the ability to be here but we just decide that we're just not going to be there. We're just not going to go. It's just not that important to us. He says this is sinning willfully because we know what we need to do. We know what is expected of us. After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. He said it can actually lead us to falling away can lead us to the point where we would need to be restored to the faith if it gets to a certain point. But we are to maintain a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He says only by keeping our eyes on God are we able to overcome the devil. Only by setting our sights on things above and not focusing upon the things of this world can we be pleasing in the sight of God. Each time that we come together, if our minds are where it needs to be, we're going to leave this place encouraged. We're going to leave this place uplifted and edified, enlightened. We're going to leave feeling spiritually stronger. We're going to learn something that we can use in our day-to-day -day lives. But too often, we allow the pain we allow the struggles, we allow the frustrations, and we allow other troubles of life to come between us and God. And sometimes we see those who allow their faith to become compromised. We stop walking in the light as he is in the light. And as such, the blood of Christ is no longer forgiving us of our sins. We stop worshiping God as we should. We stop reaching out to others and ministering to others as we can. And more than likely, we know those who eventually get to the point where they completely fall away. They're no longer faithful to the Lord as, we, as they should be. But here's what we must remember. What good is our faith unless it will carry us through those hard times? Truly, what good is our faith if we cannot use it for the motivation that we need to continue on. Press on, regardless of what we may be facing in life. But something we need to realize this morning, there's nobody here that's perfect. There's nobody here that has everything right. Every one of us this morning are a little bit bent. Every one of us have things in this life that Satan is using to try to weigh us down. To try to pull our devotion away from God. We're all a little bit bent. It may be the recent loss of a loved one. It may be the loss of a job. 
It may be some type of financial issues we may be having in life. It may be some type of health problems. It may be problems in a relationship that we have in this life. It may be marital problems. It may be issues between parents and children. It may be some type of issues that is taking place in the workplace among our co-workers that's really taxing upon us. Or it may be that there's some type of willful sin that we've allowed to come in and pulled us away from God. Or it may simply be that there's some worry that's there, some concern that we have that is just weighing us down tremendously. But although we have these bends in our life, it's up to us whether we're going to allow it to break us. If you're not a child of God, you do not have the blood of Christ to help in straightening out those problems of life. If you're not a child of God, you do not have this devoted relationship with God that gives us the catalyst that we need to stand straight, to press on, to overcome the temptations of Satan because Jesus is the only remedy. Just like the woman in our scripture reading this morning, the doctors had given up on her. There was nothing she could do. Her condition continued to worsen and worsen. More than likely by this point, she had simply reserved herself to the lot in life that she had. But then she found the remedy. And Jesus is that remedy. We today have that same remedy available to us. We have the ability to come into contact with Jesus. And regardless of what may be in our life, regardless of what our past may be like, regardless of how sinful we may have been, the blood of Christ is powerful enough to wash it all away. There is no one that reaches the point where they're too bad for God. There is no one that reaches the point where you have sinned too much to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But in order to take advantage of that remedy, we must do what the scriptures reveal. Jesus tells us that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16 and verse 16. On the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and verse 38, when they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized. So in order for us to look at our lives, to see those things that are weighing us down, to see those sins that so easily beset us, and to find the remedy for those things. First, we must place our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. We must repent of our sins. We must realize that the things of this world are not going to bring about the desired effect that we are seeking. And realize that only God can bring about that salvation, can bring about that spiritual healing. We repent of our sins. And we come forward and we, we confess that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And to me, one of the most powerful passages that we read in the Bible is where Jesus says, if you will confess my name before men, I will confess your name before my Father in heaven. Imagine that. Picture that image of Jesus there at the right hand of his Father talking about Josh DeMint or about David Futrell or about Don McGuirt. That is a powerful, powerful thought. But Jesus says that if we will confess his name before men, he'll do that very thing. And then we submit ourselves to the waters of baptism. And in the waters of baptism, we come into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. We go into that water, a lost soul. We come out of those waters a born again child of God. Our sins having been washed away. And from that point forward, we can go on living that faithful Christian life with the assurance that heaven will be our home. 
This morning, if you examine yourself and you see things that are in your life that do not need to be there, there are things that are bending your life over that are keeping you held back from serving God the way that you should, then we would encourage you this morning to seek out a solution to that problem. If you're not a child of God, follow those steps that I just shared with you and obey the gospel today. If you are a child of God and you've strayed from the faith, be restored today while you have this opportunity. Today you are among those who love you more than anyone else in this world. We want you to go to heaven and we want to help you get there. And if there's anything that we can help you with of a spiritual nature, we would encourage you to come forward and make that known while together we stand and sing. Ooh, let the Lord is there.